recording is started. OK. So the question was talking about <clears throat> on the exam, they saw a question talking about the sigmoidal or what, what kind of curve or binding curve was hemoglobin versus myoglobin. Hemoglobin is a sigmoidal curve. It's S shaped like this, <clears throat> meaning that hemoglobin goes through cooperative binding, meaning that with each oxygen that binds to hemoglobin, the affinity or its desire to grab more oxygen increases. So we get the sigmoidal curve with hemoglobin. Myoglobin is considered hyperbolic because it's constant. It's the same. Myoglobin is a single. Um, I think it technically is it, just a tertiary. Like each, each myoglobin, one myoglobin grabs one oxygen. <clears throat> so its affinity stays constant. So it's a hyperbolic right there as we increase the amount of um, partial pressure of oxygen in the air. It increases like on, on par with that. My, that's what myoglobin does. So hyperbolic myoglobin is a hyperbolic curve. Hemoglobin is a sigmoidal curve. Does that make sense now after the fact? Yeah. And you will get into this. You'll see this sort of thing again in Phys 1 when you start talking about um, like you'll we he Dr. Sarkar touched on them, but like the the Bohr graphs, um, I think it's still this kind of thing. You have like these shifts, shift left, shift right. You'll get into this a little bit in Phys One, and there's another class in the future as well. To remember which one it is, that you see this kind of graph again. Um, I always kind of hated this graph. I thought it was stupid the way like the way that they worded it was dumb but it will it will pop back up eventually great question on that really quick isn't that yeah. essentially the alkalytic and acidotic shift for the blood gases yeah thought so when when I blood clicked gets... on saturday when i was sitting on the couch yeah honestly so <clears throat> you pick a, i love when people say they finally clicked so it's kind of funny um <clears throat> A lot of this material, the way that you get to actually like understand it is you really just need to, I don't want to say stare at it for enough time, but like go through it enough times that it finally, um, like you have that aha moment yeah. where it does click. This is uh, cell signaling. Okay, let me open that up. <clears throat> I one, I can one. We did get to use our play on words, though, for uh, the test for the acetic and amino acids. <laughs> There's a question about them. Oh, uh, the which which city which of a city of glutes. <laughs> nice. I'm telling you, they're, those things, they're kind of stupid when you're learning them, but they work. They really, really do work. Okie dokie. So strategy wise, let's start this. Let's. Because I think the, these questions, I want to make sure that we get through as many of these questions as possible. Because I think looking and seeing the questions, understanding the questions is the most helpful. Especially because you guys can can come back and watch this again as well as you like go through the actual lecture material. So, and we can kind of work through and explain, and I can explain the ins and out of these questions uh, as we go through them. That way we're, we're not just kind of reading from the textbook. Does that sound okay? Mm-hmm. Mind by me. <laughs> How did your cramming for uh, boards go? Oh, I'm not done. I'm still not done. I'm not even close to being done. <laughs> I got, like, probably at least 25 more hours of stuff to go through. 
Hi. <clears throat> Happier times. Binding of which of the following chemical messenger molecules to its specific receptors can activate an ion channel. So we're talking about ion channels. With all of these, let's see if what we can remember, give or take. Um, have you guys talked at all about insulin yet? Nope. Okay. So when we talk about, let me open up this guy. Let me find, when we talk about receptors, we have a couple of different types of receptors. Okay. We have, um, where's the picture I want? Here we go. <clears throat> we have our ion channels, which most commonly when we talk about ions, we're talking about cat cat ions, um, specifically sodium and potassium. Um, something to remember that sodium. So if we have our cell wall right here, there's way more sodium outside of the cell. And there's way more potassium inside of the cell. Kind of the stupid way I remember this. Um, there's a picture that sometimes we'll use <clears throat> in physiology. It's a, it looks it looks kind of like this. If it'll let me look like this picture, I imagine I picture the banana in the ocean. I don't know why. Bananas are full of potassium. Ocean is salty. That's just what works in my brain. So potassium is on the inside. Sodium is on the outside of the cell. A lot of our, and you'll learn this a lot deeper in Phys 1 next trimester, or I think if some of you, some people are already in Phys 1, but you'll see this reaction. There is a cell, or there is a certain protein called a membrane receptor or an ion channel. So this here is an ion channel that's going to let potassium come out and let sodium come in. Was that the sodium potassium pump? Uh, one of, yeah. Um, or you can call them the voltage gated ion channels. So voltage gated um, sodium channels is another big one. I remember so, that later in the trimester. Yep. So <clears throat> ion channels, the goal is to let these cat ions or these positive ions come back and forth, specifically sodium and potassium. OK, and these are found um, in the membrane between the membrane. So it connects the outside of the cell to the inside of the cell to allow things to come in and out. Um, something similar, uh, no, I won't, go, I won't get into that yet. Um, yeah, so those are our ion, ion channels, ion channels. We also have our insulin receptors, which are kinases, which are kinase channels. This will come back several times, just like that as a specific question, it being a kinase, um, so insulin has to do with uh, with kinases. Ky kinase, remember, that's the um, any of the enzymes that are kinases have to do with phosphorylation. Then we also have G protein coupled receptors. This will be a really, really big one. We'll talk a lot about our G protein coupled receptors. And these are for sending a lot of different signals where a something will come from the outside of the cell bind to the cell membrane and pass along the information for something to happen inside of the cell. We also have nuclear receptors. Um, Dr. Sarkar loves questions about nuclear receptors. Yes. Because thyroid hormone, Dr. Sarkar actually did a lot of his studying and research into thyroid hormone. And he actually is still doing research into thyroid hormones. Thyroid hormones are an example of a nuclear receptor or a um, a st steroidal hormone that they're small enough that they can just pass straight through the cell wall and go directly to the nucleus. So that's what those 
are going to do. So if we look back at this question, our insulin. So insulin binds to our kinase receptors. Receptors. Norepinephrine. We'll talk about norepinephrine and epinephrine. Um, these receptors are our, um, what are they exactly called? The nicot nicotinic. Yeah, that's not super important. Um, you'll you don't we don't spend a lot of time on norepinephrine, epinephrine, or in epi, or in, norepinephrine, epinephrine in this class. Um, that's more physiology kind of stuff. Acetylcholine. We saw these are our ion channels, and our steroid hormones like the thyroid are nuclear receptors. Nuclear meaning nucleus. So go straight through the membrane to the nucleus. So our answer is our acetylcholine for our ion, ion channels. OK, any questions about those that we just mentioned? And a lot of this is going to be new material, so again, I'm not expecting y'all to have all of the answers. So, um, it's okay to not know everything right now. This is kind of like our introductory to everything. Okay. I'll keep my mouth shut since I know the answers. <laughs> nice. Binding of blank to its specific nicotinic receptors localized at the neuromuscular junction can activate blank channels. So we're looking at, we have nicotinic receptors at the neuromuscular junction. This will be huge in Phys 1. The Phys 1 professors love these kind of questions. <clears throat> Real quick, the nicotinic receptors. So the nicotinic receptor is a channel protein upon binding by acetylcholine opens to allow diffusion of cations. That kind of gives away the yes. um, the answer. I made a mistake. Let me go make sure that I correct this. In this, this is not the nicotinic receptors. These are the muscarinic receptors, which again, you'll learn more about those a little bit later. We don't spend a lot of time on them here. So nicotinic receptors, we see the word nicotinic. We want to associate it with acetylcholine. Neuromuscular junction. Um, you'll learn all about some stuff that are called action potentials next trimester in, in phys. Action potentials. This is how um, our, the messages from our nerves get transmitted from the nerves to the muscles in this beautiful place called the neuromuscular junction. This picture is going to look intimidating right now. We don't have to know all this stuff. This is for the future. Where we have part of our nerve with a part of the axon. It comes down right here, releases acetylcholine into this neuromuscular junction right here neuro muscle junction where they meet the acetylcholine comes and binds to these ion channels the ion channels are going to let sodium rush in <clears throat> when sodium rushes in you get a change in the overall um, voltage that's inside of this area and that change in voltage begins a signal that will go along the muscle and help us activate the muscle later on. So again, only thing that we want to focus on right now is that the acetylcholine is released in the neuromuscular junction and binds to nicotinic ion channels. Okay, that's what we need to know for right now. So here our answer, we have acetylcholine and sodium.
if we look at this as well, if we think so, neuromuscular. If we know if we know what the neuromuscular junction is, that it's um, going to we're going to have stuff enter the cell from the from the neuromuscular junction. We can look at this and think, look, take a look, couple look at these couple of the, these other options and take a look at them. Um, I'm going to give you some additional information on these that you'll use more in Phys one later on, but it's good to know now. Glucagon, as well as GABA. Both of these guys are found in the central nervous system, so the spinal cord and the brain. Um, GABA inhibits. Another one that it also inhibits um, is glycine. If you've ever heard of the drug gabapentin, I'm, I'm sure almost everybody's heard of that drug. A lot of people take their gabapentin. Gabapentin's job is to actually inhibit things in the central nervous system. It's an inhibitory drug. Um, like they, they give it to a lot of patients that have restless leg syndrome, where like their legs fidgety, can't stop moving. Um, they think they still don't have an answer for kind of what causes that, but they think it's due to issues in the brain dampening and inhibiting certain signals. So they give them extra GABA in order to inhibit it. Uh, glucagon. Act. Uh, Glucagon is one of our activators. Um, more often, you see glutamate. Glutamate. Glu glucagon is kind of related to glutamate. But more, more often, you'll see glutamate. Remember, glutamate activates. Glycine, with the I, inhibits. You'll want to remember that for Phys 1. Uh, norepinephrine. We saw those are our muscarinic. Again, don't have to worry too much about those right now. We'll look back at those later. And then our acetylcholine and our uh, and sodium acetylcholine chloride. The reason why it can't be chloride, why this cannot be the right answer, is because of the way that the cells typically are. Okay, the, a normal cell overall is negative, negatively charged, okay? And that's because it is full of proteins, which are highly negative, okay? So depending on the cell that you're talking about, it's anywhere from around negative 60, to negative 90 millivolts is the charge of a cell, OK? So when we want to send a signal with this, the cell, we make it more positive. So we need a cation, need a cation to make the cell positive to send a signal. You'll get way deeper into this in Phys 1. This is kind of as, as deep as we need to go right here, right now. So, and that's even a little bit deeper than we need to go here. It's just good to start to introduce you guys to these ideas now um, so that you're not caught off guard a little bit later on. Okay. Any questions so far? Anything you clarified? Okay, just if at any point you need to have a question or want something clarified, feel free to just jump in. Let me actually do this. Let me see if I can hide the answer this way. There we go. Sweet. That makes it easier. Okay. <clears throat> CAMP, C A cyclic AMP or CAMP can be inactivated by a specific blank. So when we're talking about CAMP, CAMP is related to what is called a G protein coupled reaction. And let me actually pull up 
some stuff from my notes. Uh, it's here somewhere. Um, is it in here? Let me see if I can find it real quick. Um, where's my pretty drawing? Ah, here's my pretty drawing. Oh, wait, no, where'd it go? All right, let me find it. Do, 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 do. So much information. Do, 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 do. Come on. Oh, almost there. Here's my pretty drawing. Yeah, this is this is a really, really important concept. So I'm going to walk through it kind of slow. OK. So with a G protein coupled reaction, let me actually pull up another picture as well that he should have one here. Here we go. So <clears throat> this is going to be taking place at the cell membrane, OK? So here we have the cell membrane, and we have a G protein coupled receptor. So this is a receptor coupled with a G protein. So the G protein is made up of a couple different components. OK, it's made up of a an alpha component, a beta component, and a gamma component. So think of kind of it's like a quaternary protein with all of those different components smashed together. So you have an alpha component, a beta component, and a gamma component with GDP, and they all come together and fuse together to form the G protein. OK. Now what happens is a ligand the knowing that this is super important to know what a ligand is the ligand is literally just the thing that comes to bind so it's a molecule or an ion that is going to come and attach to something in order to cause something else to happen okay it can be a big molecule it can be a small molecule it can be a singular ion it can be a couple different things all do working towards the same job. But the important thing is that it's something that's going to come and it's going to bind to the receptor to cause something to happen. OK. So when the ligand comes and binds to the receptor, it's going to have it, It's going to cause GTP. So just like we have, we talked about ATP and ADP, the adenosine triphosphate and the adenosine diphosphate. GDP is does a very a very similar job, just that instead of adenosine, it's guanine. So this is a guanine diphosphate and a guanine triphosphate. Okay. So. <clears throat> When a GTP, so when energy is introduced to our G protein, it's going to activate our G protein. OK. Which when it's activated, our GT, our GDP gets given that extra energy turns into GTP and the beta and the gamma parts split off. And the alpha sticks with it. OK. Is everybody following me up to this point? OK. Just quick recap. We have our G protein. GTP comes in, gives it energy. 
the GTP and the get and the alpha stay together, the beta and the gamma break off. <clears throat> Next step, this part, our now active G protein, that's just the GTP and the alpha component, are going to go and act on a protein that's sitting in the membrane called adenylate cyclase. We can look at his picture here. So he has our adenylate cyclase right here. So our, so these get kicked off, they get kicked out, and this comes and acts on adenylate cyclase. Now, <clears throat> adenylate cyclase brings in an ATP, so more energy, and it's going to then act on cyclic AMP. Okay? Let me make sure. Okay. So it acts on cyclic AMP, and our cyclic AMP is going to get activated. So our adenylate cyclase activates uses the ATP to activate cyclic AMP. Our cyclic AMP is then going to come, now that this is activated, so all this stuff before was to activate our cyclic AMP. When it's activated, it's now inside of the cell, and it goes and it finds another enzyme or protein called protein kinase. So if we look at the name protein kinase, we can expect it's going to find a specific protein and it's going to phosphorylate it. It's going to give it a phosphorus because it's a kinase. Ky kinases phosphorylate stuff. That's their job. Protein kinase. So cyclic AMP comes, it acts on our protein kinase. Protein kinase is made up of these two R groups and these two Cs, okay? Uh, they stand for something specific. I don't remember exactly what they specifically stand for, but <clears throat> there's an R and then there's Cs. Our cyclic AMP binds to the Rs and pops them off and pulls them off so that we have just these two C components. These two C components are the activated form of protein kinase. These two pieces of our protein kinase are going to go off, find the proper protein that they're supposed to go and do, and they phosphorylate it. They phosphorylate that other specific protein. This causes a chain reaction where there can be multiple, we kind of skip this step, but this, there can be multiple other proteins. So it can go to protein one, protein two, protein three, protein four, et cetera, until it finally gets to its target protein, the protein that we're really trying to activate within this. So we just kind of skip this whole step and just say, so it phosphorylates protein and then it eventually gets to its target protein. And when it finally gets to that target protein, it is going to phosphorylate it. And when it's phosphorylated, it is activated. And then it goes off and does whatever job it that specific protein was meant to do. <clears throat> OK. I know this might be new and it might not all make sense right now. But does that roughly make sense in the sense of kind of the flow of the G protein coupled reaction. Makes a little more sense. Not really, but I don't really okay. know how to have it clarified either. So go ahead. Um, easiest way to clear to like to understand this whole thing is to is really to draw it. So if you practice drawing this, we can make this even simpler. 
So we start off first of all. Where where are we starting? Where are we in at with with the cell? Are we outside of the cell, inside of the cell, or on the membrane? Cell membrane. So we're here at the cell membrane, right? The cell the cell membrane. If we when we talk about the cell membrane, how do we describe? The cell membrane. What is the cell membrane made up of? Phospholipids. Yes, it's a phospholipid bilayer. So we have rows of phosphorus like this, all stacked up on both sides with lipid tails that connect them like this. Okay. There's a lot of different <coughs> molecules that are not able to pass through the phospholipid bilayer. So they, they need a way to tell the inside of the cell what the inside of the cell needs to do. There needs to be a way to send a message through the cell. One of those ways is through G protein coupled receptors. Okay. So, kind of starting from the beginning, we have our receptor, and that receptor is connected to our G protein. This is why it's called a G protein coupled receptor, because the G protein and the receptor are coupled. Now, Elizabeth, I want you to answer this for me. The G protein is made up of four things all together. Can you tell me what one of those things is? No, I have no clue. OK, can somebody help her? Let's look at the G. Remember, we talked, I'd mentioned briefly GDP, right? That's one of the components. Does anybody remember what GDP stands for? Not gross domestic product. I know it's a, you said it's a diphosphate. I don't remember what you said the G stands for. Perfect. Awesome. It's a diphosphate. Does anybody remember what the G stands for? The G stands for guanine. So just like ATP is adenosine triphosphate or diphosphate, right now we have guanine diphosphate. Okay. Then we also have three other. There's one, two, and three other components. These are given the values or the the names. The alpha part. We have the beta part. And the gamma part. OK, these are fancy Greek letters, but in all reality, it's just it's just a way to keep them keep track of them. Are we to get are we all here so far, Elizabeth? Yes. OK. So <clears throat> receptors, what's the point of a receptor? What what is the thing that's called that called that's going to come to bind to the receptors? The enzyme. So Typically, something will bind to an enzyme. An enzyme has a receptor on it. So with enzymes, it's a substrate. But didn't you use a different word? Substrate, we, we can use the word ligand. Ligand. It sounds like a confusing word, but really all it means is the thing that's coming to bind to the receptor. Okay. It's a little bit 
different than an enzyme than with an enzyme reaction because with an enzyme reaction right we're going to take substrates and either break them apart or put them together to get products right the ligand the ligand's only job is to come and bind to the receptor and by binding to the receptor it's going to cause this whole structure because that whole structure is a big quaternary protein think of it like oxygen binding to hemoglobin when oxygen comes and binds to hemoglobin the whole structure changes shape okay so in this case a ligand or just a messenger chemical a messenger chemical or a messenger molecule comes and binds to this receptor and this whole G protein structure is going to change its shape. When it changes its shape, it allows, it opens up a spot for a GTP to come into the picture. Um, Elizabeth, help me out. What is GTP? stand for what is it what is that molecule that would be guanine triphosphate perfect so the more phosphates when we, when we talk about energy right if we think back hopefully a little bit of previous knowledge which has more energy a an atp or an adp <laughs> atp right because T tri, it has three bonds. The more bonds that we have, the more potential chemical energy we have. So GTP comes in and has a little bit more energy. And GTP is going to break one of its bonds, one of its phosphorus bonds, and give energy to the G protein. When it gives that energy to this whole G protein, it's going to cause a change in the, this whole G protein, okay? And that change is it's going to break off our beta and gamma parts. Okay, so our beta and our gamma parts, uh, they don't like fully, I, this is just, I'm exaggerating a little bit how they break off. They separate, like they don't like fly all the way over here, but they, they separate. Okay, and so now we are left. Where's my eraser? We are left with just our guanine, and this actually becomes that energy gets absorbed into it, and it technically becomes. A triphosphate and the alpha part. So we're just left with this part right here. Uh, here we go. So we're just left with this part right here. When once the GTP donates its energy. Okay. Our next step in the whole process is we have another protein that's here in the membrane. That is called adenylate cyclase. Okay. So this is another protein that's already here. It's just chilling, hanging out, waiting. <clears throat> Once the G protein has gone through all of these steps to break away from the beta and the gamma components, it is now activated. It's active. And it is going to come and interact with the adenylate cyclase. And by interacting with the adenylate cyclase, it's going to cause, it's going to come in and almost like and bind to it and potentially. And um, whenever two things bind together, we're going to get some conformational changes. We're going to get some change in the shape, which then allows for an A. TP to come and give energy 
to the adenylate cyclase. Okay, so our G protein, our GTP and our alpha component activate our adenylate cyclase and ATP comes in and donates energy. Are we together still so far? So far. Okay. When this happens, when our ATP and it goes and activates our adenylate cyclase, this, it's going to use this energy from the ATP, the adenylate cyclase, uses the energy from the ATP to act on another protein called cyclic AMP or CAMP. So it then comes in, that, that energy activates our CAMP, our cyclic AMP. Cyclic AMP is going to go off inside of the cell and it's going to find another protein called protein kinase A, PKA, protein kinase A, and it's going to activate protein kinase A. So it's really just kind of a, a like a step by step of activating different things. The ligand binds to the receptor and activates the receptor. The receptor being activated activates the G protein by kicking off the beta and the gamma. The G protein then activates adenylate cyclase. Adenylate cyclase is then responsible for activating cyclic AMP. Cyclic AMP is then responsible for activating PKA. And finally, PKA is responsible for activating activating the target protein inside of the cell. Whatever that protein might be, there's a cup there's a handful of different types of proteins that can be the tar target protein. But whatever the specific target protein is for this ligand and this receptor is going to eventually be activated and it will carry off its job to do whatever it is that the cell needs to do um, be based on what, what, what the message was that was sent. If it's still a little bit confusing, um, the YouTube video that I have, I break it down again even more through each step by step. Um, you can also look up a couple other videos on the have like animations of this whole process happening. But really, like what you just main things that you need to understand and pull from this is just the step by step process. Not a ton of like why, like why does this happen? Why does it break apart? Who cares? That's above our pay grade. The most important thing to know is the step by step. What activates what? What breaks off when? what is used when, and, and that's as far as we really need to go. A lot of our questions are going to be based off of, of that process. Okay? Thank you. That's more clear now. Good. Awesome. And then eventually, when you keep going, eventually, when he, you actually cover it in the lecture and stuff and go back and watch the videos, I'll go through this whole thing, and you can, you can watch that. Um, and hopefully understand even a little bit, even a little bit better. So, <clears throat> um, we got through that whole process. A cup. There are a couple of the other little details. Where? Oh, did I close that word? Oh no, I didn't. <clears throat> Within here, so we got the whole process down, kind of start to finish, like what activates what. We also have bits and pieces that inactivate that kind of that give that fee negative feedback if we remember talking about that before, during last exam negative feedback where the creation of some type of product goes backwards and inactivates a different portion that's what we we will see here so our activated protein kinase a uh let's see did you, did you, did you, to go. Uh, I forgot what I was trying to say. A little late. Okay. 
camp can be activated by a specific um I'm pretty sure if I'm not right. The is it oh wrong. The answer is the, is the protein kinase A because of the of the feed idea of feedback. So protein kinase A is when we get our document. When we get um, enough of our cyclic AMP activated and it activates the PKA. The PKA, once we've formed enough of this product, it's a feedback and it inhibits our cyclic AMP. This will probably, I feel like this will be almost an exact question. He might add a little bit extra fluff words, but he'll probably use this exact question. Whew. Hopefully with all that explaining, we unlock a couple more answers with these questions. <laughs> uh, let me do this so it's a little easier. Shoot. OK. Coupling of a G pro protein alpha subunit to a ligand occupied receptor initially leads to blank. So the kind of the first step. So when we talked about the ligand comes and binds to the receptor and then the receptor is going to cause a change to happen with our G protein where it kicks off the beta and gamma subunits. Immediately after that happens, what comes up to give energy? GTP. The GTP. So we get an exchange of bound GDP with GTP. The GTP gives us our energy. Sweet. Doesn't it feel good when you get the answer right off the bat? Very. Very, especially <laughs> for this class, yes. Okay. <clears throat> Looking here, G protein mediated hormonal response may be terminated by which of the following? An increase in protein phosphorylation of the substrate proteins, activation of adenylate cyclase specific activity, the removal of second messenger cyclic AMP, the inactivation of phosphodiesterase enzyme. So reading through these, first of all, in any point, uh, we did technically, there's a piece of that in there, but um, I'm going to give the, the answers that I know for a fact are not correct. So we have activation of adenylate cyclase, save activity. If we activate adenylate cyclase, right? Activation of the adenylate cyclase leads to us activating what next? What, get, what gets activated after adenylate cyclase? The camp. Camp. Exactly, our camp and then our PKA. So if we activate adenylate cyclase, are we going to stop the reaction? Or is that going to no. cause the reaction to go forward? It's going to cause it to forward. move forward. Perfect. So we know for a fact that it's not going to be that one. Uh, an increase in protein phosphorylation of the substrate proteins. So we get all that's all the way down to the very, very bottom, the very, very end. Um, honestly, just this doesn't have to do a lot with everything that we just talked about. And he's going to mainly focus on the reactions themselves of the G protein coupled reaction. This is not going to be that one. And honestly, I just I just don't like that. I don't I this this whole thing, to be honest, kind of confuses me. So if I'm guessing, I'm also just not choosing that. Um, now we have two. So we have the removal of the messenger C of camp. And the inactivation of phosphodiestease enzyme. The phosphodiestease enzyme. Diesterase. That's spelled. They really spelled it wrong in Linus, but whatever. <clears throat> this book has a crap ton of typos. 
by the way. Yeah, <laughs> it happens. Um, Is it diastease or diesterase? I'm pretty sure it's diesterase. E R A S E. It's just missing. Yeah. This is missing the diesterase, like that. So down here, this is getting a little bit deeper than the than this drawing that we did. Um, we're focusing in on this step right here. This is what we're going to focus on right here. Our cyclic AMP, the way that it activates phospho uh, protein kinase A, <clears throat> is that we have our cyclic AMPs bind to these R proteins, the R proteins of PKA, and pulls them off so that we're left with the active portion of PKA. Um, one of the ways, oh, my brain, where's the, here it is, phosphodiesterase, it's responsible, it's going to break the phosphodiester bond, where is all this? I don't, I don't remember exactly where the bond specifically breaks or what it specifically does. This this will be I'm probably going more into this into my YouTube video. It's been a little while since I've looked at at this specific reaction. Um, but. Honestly, I don't have the I don't have the super brain power to go over this right now. <laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> um, where to go? But the answer is going to be this guy here, the messenger cyclic AMP. What it's talking about is this cyclic AMP right here. This is actually the R group. Once you remove both of those, these R proteins are going to combine back with the C ones and inactivate PKA, which is going to then halt and pause the reaction. I know how it happens. I just don't quite remember quite all the nitty gritty details. When you get into your lecture, so this is one of those things, pay attention to this if he mentions it at all in the lecture, just so that way you know exactly what it is that it's, that it's talking about. Okay, another one. This one, we sh these next couple we should know. In G protein coupled receptors, what subunit binds to GTP and has intrinsic GTPase activity? Really, what this question is asking is which of the subunits stays bound to the GTP? Alpha. The alpha. E alpha. Mm -hmm. Correct. Race. Uh oh. Why would it erase? Because it was over here. There we go. The inactive form of a G protein is bound to GTP, GDP, ATP, or cyclic AMP. GDP. Correct, GDP. Because we have the GDP. The alpha component. The beta component and the gamma component all bound together. As soon as we get GTP in here, these guys go away, and then it becomes active. Okay. These next couple questions, I want to break down and think about it. So lipophobic type of first chemical messenger molecules may have what type of receptors? So if we look at lipophobic, right? What does that word mean? Phospholipid. 
doesn't like no, lipids. Doesn't like lipids. It literally means afraid of lipids. Where in our cell do we have lipids that would make it difficult for that messenger to get into the cell? Membrane. Our phospholipid bilayer, right? So if something is lipophobic or afraid of lipids, it's not going to be able to cross the the membrane. This um, the way that this is worded right here. First chemical messenger molecules. This is saying very similar. This would be like our ligands, the ones that stay on the outside. The very first chemical messenger, the very first. Um, chemical to come and bind and to start the reaction. That's what we're talking about with first chemical messenger molecules. So if they can't get through the membrane, right, what type of receptors are they most likely going to have? Membrane receptors. Membrane receptors, right? Because nuclear receptors, where are nuclear receptors located? The nucleus. The nucleus. Do you just remember, we mentioned it briefly, what kind of uh, messengers are binds to nuclear receptors. It's okay if you don't remember. We mentioned it super briefly. I remember you saying it. I just don't remember what you said. Yeah, I don't either. The steroid. Our steroids. Yeah. The big one that Dr. Sarkar loves. What? Which one are those? <laughs> Our thyroid. Steroid. Yeah. It's a, one of the really, really big ones. You'll talk more about that. You'll see, like, he, he spends a good chunk of time talking about thyroid because he loves it. <laughs> okay. Most signal transduction pathway for hormones that are proteins have in common all of the following except nuclear receptors, receptors with multiple transmembrane segments, cyclic nucleotides, receptors that interact with G proteins. I'm going to be completely honest. This is probably a question that I would look at and go, huh? And I would look at the answer, highlight the answer, and I'm going to come back to this one and figure out what the heck it's talking about. Sounds good to me. I would go go look in like I would look in the book. Um, if you can't like, write this question down, the questions that are really like head scratchers that are like, what the heck is that asking? Um, Honestly, if you can do this, if we if we can get ahead like this and do this um, every Tuesday and get through a lot of these questions, we can write down these questions before y'all like go go through your lectures and stuff. And then you can specifically look for this kind of information and see if it pops up and hopefully be able to come back and answer it. That's the goal. We'll try and get it as, as ahead as we can. It's definitely a head scratcher question because I couldn't remember what it was the first time I took it. Yeah, that's that's one of those questions that I'm honestly I'm just like, meh, guess and <laughs> guess and come back later. That one is confusing because steroids are hormones, so it's like, you'd well, think. some are not all. Some are, yeah. yeah. Most people don't realize it, but vitamin D is a steroid. That are proteins I have in common all the following except. Yeah, I would come back to this and probably look up definitions of a couple of things like cyclic nucleotides i'm not super clear i couldn't describe that in my own words um receptors that interact with g proteins that makes sense because the hormones will certain hormones do do that um receptors with multiple transmembrane segments uh this sounds very similar multiple transmembrane segments sounds very similar to just g protein coupled like it sounds like another way to say G protein coupled receptors. And I wonder is cyclic what is Oh. <laughs> our cyclic nucleotide is cyclic AMP is our camp. So this is literally Listen. saying G protein coupled receptors, G protein coupled receptors, G protein coupled receptors. They're all saying the same thing. Yep, just <laughs> different ways of saying the same thing. 
So since they're all the same thing, it explains why the first one's the right answer. Yeah, we figured it out, guys. Good job. Way to go. Round of applause for Drake. Yeah, it's my brain is woo. So it was mine yesterday. Okay. <laughs> Most trans. I'm glad you guys are here, though. This honestly, like, the fact that y'all are here, this shows that you, you guys, the people that come tutoring us, even when it's hard, y'all are the ones that are going to make fantastic doctors. Um, that's not to say anybody who's watching this after the fact. If you're taking the time to watch this after the fact, you'll also be amazing. But <laughs> put putting in the time and the effort on the late nights and when it's hard and when nobody's looking, that's what's going to make the difference between being between people that are good and people that are great. Okay. Most transduction systems for hormones and sensory stimuli that involve the trimeric G proteins have in common all of the following except this sounds like the exact same question that we just got asked i'm going to take a wild guess and say nuclear receptors if i'm wrong hey it's almost the exact same question just he used a very fancy words trimeric g proteins gtp trimeric <laughs> triphosphate you cheeky tricky, bugger. Tricky. You chick cheeky bugger. Um, transduction system for hormones and sensory stimuli. Hormones and sensory stimuli. Again, those are going to be our ligands. Yeah. Sneaky, sneaky. <clears throat> Presence of what kind of receptor is normally expected for lipophobic type of first chemical messenger molecules? Didn't we already have this exact question? Yep. I should be on membrane receptors. I think it's, it's worded worded slightly. Yeah, it's worded slightly different. Yep. But honestly, this is the kind of stuff that he he'll pull on his exams as well. Ooh. He does. Gotta hide the answer from you guys. I will say he does that on quite a few tests and even quizzes. He'll do it. Same. It's basically the same question, just. Phrase differently. Different, wor different words. Okay. Protein kinase A is completely inhibited by cyclic AMP, is allosterically activated by cyclic AMP, is activated by G CGMP. It S, S is non-competitively inhibited by cyclic AMP. So, Elizabeth, is protein kinase A activated by CAMP or inhibited by CAMP? Activated. Nice. So, immediately off the bat, no. No. And have we talked about cyclic GMP at all? Nope. So, go away. Ba boom. I love it. Is uh is the G protein coupled reaction kind of stuff? These kind of questions is that is that helping make a little bit more sense of it? A lot more, yes. Sweet. Okay. Receptors for norepinephrine is known as adrenergic receptors. Um this will get brought up again later. So adrenergic is like the first chunk and you also have adrenergic muscarinic so there's like a two-parter to it that combines word so uh we talked about previously norepinephrine has muscarinic receptors they're also you know, going to be called parts of them are going to be called adrenergic receptors um referring to similar ideas you'll see that more in phys one don't worry too much about that right now <laughs> okay, which of the following is not involved in signal transduction mediated by adrenergic receptor pathway? So all of this, if we look at this, GTP, ATP, CAMP, all of those are involved in our G-protein coupled receptors, right? 
Which one's not? <laughs> so, which one is not? The one that's not involved in our G-protein coupled receptor. Now we know this will go in our little book of AKAs. If we see adrenergic receptor pathway, all that's saying is G-protein coupled receptors again. So there's another little AKA for our book. Yeah, these questions are definitely helpful. Okay. Steroid hormone receptor is an example of which of the following? Is it a G protein coupled receptor? Nope. Nope. Which one? Which one, so immediately all of the above is gone. Inositol phosphate mediated signal transduction. When we talked about soft phosphate, right? What yep. did we? What was the only type of receptor that we mentioned that involves like phosphates or kinase? There's one specific thing. It's um, involves blood sugar that mentioned the phosphates. Insulin. Yeah, our insulin. Which is part of venesotol. Yeah, and so last choice. Our nuclear receptors. So what's also really, really cool about these questions is you can take them and make up your own questions based off of this. So steroid hormone receptor is an example of blank. We could also say adrenergic receptors receptor is an example of what? G protein coupled receptor. So we can change this exact same question and get so that the question is each of the different answers, not draw all the above, because those can't all be true. But so you can change this into three separate questions. So now you have three practice questions from this one. The neurotransmitter blank may mediate its action through its specific ion channel membrane receptors. Keyword here is going to be neurotransmitter. Is insulin a neurotransmitter? No. No, it is not. Glucagon? No. Kind of in a different way when it's changed to glutamate, but no. Acetylcholine? Don't think so. Honestly, oh, it is. So this question isn't. I would probably meet with him and I would probably get this question so that either of these answers would be acceptable because norepinephrine is a neurotransmitter as well. Uh, norepinephrine is one of the weird ones that it's a neurotransmitter and a hormone. OK. Um. Technically, you can make an argument that both of those answers are correct. Um, just if you if you pick either of either of those, just make sure that you know that you can defend your position. I guess acetylcholine. I get why he picks acetylcholine. Of these two, if you get this exact question on the test, pick acetylcholine. Acetylcholine is the better answer um, because it is more of a specific ion channel. Nor epinephrine as a hormone will be the G protein coupled receptors um, as a hormone. As a neurotransmitter, it acts a little bit differently, but if you get this on the test, pick acetylcholine um, because it's the technically more correct answer still kind of a dumb question but it is what it is i didn't write the questions
He likes perfect world questions, and I don't like it. Yep. Okay. <clears throat> the substrate for the enzyme adenylate cyclase is blank. So when we talk about substrate, right, the substrate is the thing that's going to take into it and use to, to get to a product. What is our substrate for our adenylate cyclase? ATP. Elizabeth, killing it out here. Once I understood that whole process, I'm like, oh, I got it. <laughs> <laughs> she, she had her click moment. I loved it. Uh, I don't know if he still has this issue on some of his tests. There will be times on his exams when, like, you'll get a question, and instead of it being a Greek letter, it'll be, like, a number two or, like, an exclamation point or something like that. Has he fixed that? Did you see any I of that? I have not seen that occur, so I'm assuming it's fixed. Okay. Okay. I've just seen things maybe spelled different, but that's it. Yeah. If if at some point you do see that on a test, hopefully he's fixed it. Blackboard was really wonky about some of that at times. Um, if you do see that, you'll you should. It's usually like a pretty common symbol, and you'll start to see it pop up in a couple different questions. So you can, if it does happen, you just kind of need. It, hopefully, you know the material well enough that with context of the rest of the question you know what it's ref which what it's referring to so like if this question here if it was like what is the effect of activated g exclamation point subunit hopefully you'd know the activated g protein subunit that activated portion is alpha and it wouldn't affect a lot the question it's just sometimes it can be a little bit confusing to read so just just watch for that. If it does become an issue, make sure that you reach out to him and, and, and let him know kind of what was going on. And if it did throw you off on the question, um, honestly, if it's throwing you off reading and trying to understand the question, click an answer choice and get out of there and come back to it if you can, if you have time or meet with him after the fact and just be like, hey, I got really thrown off by this because of whatever, because of the way that it reads and fight for your points after the fact rather than wasting time on it. Okay. What is the effect of activated G alpha subunit on the activity of adenylate cyclase in the G protein mediated signaling cascade? Here's another beautiful AKA. G protein mediated signaling cascade. There's another AKA for G protein coupled reactions. When our activated G alpha subunit is there, what is it? What is its next step? What does it do? Produce camp or activate camp. Yeah, it activates and produces camp. So more than likely, wait. Mm, uh, this is one of those times where I look at it and I'm like, I feel like that question is wrong. I don't like this question. This is another one. Um, honestly, also, if you have time, like if you have. Uh, do you guys have a live session this week? It'll nope. be next week, right? No, it would. Yeah, it'll be next week. So next week during the live session, if there is a chance to ask a question, if this sort of thing comes up. If you see this at all, I would make sure you ask him this question specifically and have so him explain it. Would it? 
Would it not make sense for it to be that, though, because of the feedback loop? I'm just a little bit thrown off by the G alpha I subunit where I'm so in, in my brain, like, yes, like, there's a feedback loop, but when the G alpha subunit is activated, um, it typically activates the adenylate cyclase. Yeah. Not because it's 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 in front of it, not behind it. So I might be missing something like the G alpha I. I'm I might be misunderstanding that. Which is why I say this will be a good question to bring up to him and ask exactly what that is. If you see it in either in the book or in something else, pay attention to it and come back and remember this question. So, yeah, this is one that I'm I'm not entirely sure. I'm not I'm not afraid to admit that I'm not entirely sure how like what what is, I'm missing in this question. So this is what would be one for him. And at the end of the day, if he asks this specific question, you'll know that this is the answer. So if you can't figure it out, go, you know, off, then memorization. go off of the memorization. As, as if, if you only have to memorize two out of if, like one tenth of the information is memorization and the rest you understand, that's not too bad. <laughs> those are I'll play for those numbers. Uh, this question we literally already had. This is the repeat question. The ATP. What is true about a hormone that mediates its actions through nuclear receptors? It causes gene expression. It causes protein phosphorylation. It directly activates protein kinase C. It does not influence mRNA synthesis. So we didn't talk really about the nuclear receptors a whole lot. Um, does anybody have, I guess besides Christine, Kristen, how does anybody have have a guess <laughs> as to what this could be? What this could be? It does not influence mRNA synthesis. Okay. That's my guess. <laughs> yes, good guess. It's a good guess because mRNA comes from the nucleus, um, and yep. that's where the nuclear receptors are. So <laughs> this would be a great explanation. So nuclear receptors. Um, are whenever are going to be inside of the nucleus, and they're actually attached to the DNA itself. So we have our DNA double helix strand, and on the DNA, we'll have these receptors, these nuclear receptors. A hormone's going to come down and bind to it and cause it to replicate a portion that's going to go off and form a protein. So forms a protein. So for example, um, let's see which example we want to use. Um, Testosterone is one of the examples. Testosterone is a hormone that comes and activates the nuclear receptors. And an influx of testosterone into the system is going to cause the body to elicit certain, to, to start to express certain genes, to start to express certain traits. For example, when a, a, a guy goes through puberty, suddenly he starts growing more facial hair. He starts... Um, he grows more muscle. He tends to like gets you get the growth spurt. You get the sort of things. You get those changes in the body that occur because of those specific hormones. So, with hormones that are on the nuclear receptors, nuclear receptors. This is going to be the answer. It causes a specific gene expression because these specific chunks of DNA on our um, on our DNA that code for these proteins. They are our genes, okay? And they cause the formation of proteins. The protein phosphorylation is more our G protein coupled receptors. Um, protein kinase C, we haven't seen protein kinase C yet. That's a whole, that's a different thing. And it does create, in order to form a protein, it does that by making messenger RNA um, have you guys gone over RNA synthesis at all yet in um, cells and tissues? 
no. No, okay. but I mean, just from undergrad, I know kind of what yeah. they do. There's a little bit in undergrad. Um, you'll, I, I'm pretty sure you go over it a little bit in cells and tissues. And later on in this class as well, you'll cover, I think it's this class. It's either this one or biochem. It might might be it's beginning of biochem. It is? Okay. Later on, you'll go over like the mRNA formation and all of all of that goodness. But yeah. For not having seen any, not having really talked about any of this at all, really, really good guess, really good understanding. Um, in this case, it's going to be that it, it, it does, um, it cause it does cause gene expression. Okay, we're going to do two more and then I think we'll, we'll call it a night. Does that sound fair? Yep. Sounds good. Okie dokie. What is true of G protein? When ATP binds to G protein, it is active. Is that a true or a false statement? False, because the G protein doesn't bind to the ATP. Mm -hmm. so it's not ATP, right? It's GTP. G it's it's GTP. GTP. Nice. It's supposed to be GTP. When G protein is bound to GDP, it is active. Is that true or false? False. False. It's false. What is it bound to when it is active? GTP. GTP. It's GTP in what subunit? Alpha. A. And that alpha subunit has something that's called uh, in frick. What's it called? Intrinsic some intrinsic GTPase. That'll be a question for for later. Um, it has that capability. In, intrinsic GTPase means that it has a built-in GTP like breakdown enzyme. So that way, as soon as it's finished doing its job, it can cut off one of those phosphates, turn back into GDP, refuse, and inactivate itself. So it doesn't just keep running. <clears throat> when cyclic AMP is bound to G protein, it is inactive. The last one, so we're looking between these last two. Uh, when GTP binds to G protein, it is activated. Which of those is is true? GTP B. binds to G protein, it's active. Boom. Good job. Last one, which of the following can be considered as a second messenger molecule. Do you remember what we called, what was the, what did we say was the first messenger molecule? The ligand. Equals that ligand. It was outside of the cell. So second messenger molecule, what would we think would be the second messenger molecule? The camp. The one above and... also says ATP instead of GTP is the correct answer. Well, that's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I was about to say, I was like, um. That is very, very wrong. It's when GTP binds to G protein, it is active. Yeah. That's, this is why with this kind of stuff, um, like we, and don't expect, like, teach, teachers, professors make mistakes. And I guarantee you on each of the exams that you'll take in every single class, at least one or two questions are going to be miskeyed or there are technically multiple right answers. That's one of the reasons you want to make sure that you meet meet with the professors whenever you can, especially like if your grade depends on that class, like if like your score like a little bit lower than you would have liked. Um, make sure that you meet with the professors and go through them question by question. Don't go in. It's it's hard to to go in with like an accepting and a calm mind when you're kind of freaking out about your grade. And and honestly, some of the teachers um, don't have the best, what I would call bedside manner when you talk to them. It can come off a little bit rude, a little bit kind of butting heads a little bit. <laughs> but I, it's I'm a, a part of that, you know, is that um, they, they might they, their skill set, you know, they they know this material super super well, and they they know what they're talking about. It's just like maybe kind of expressing it 
might not be their, their strongest suit. So it's very, very important when you do talk to the teachers, take a deep breath, relax, and just kind of nod. Don't get upset if something's going on. Remember that, you know, even if um, even if even if maybe their bedside manner isn't perfect or what you want it to be for you, they are there for you and they're trying their best to help you and they want you to succeed. OK, so remember, they want you to succeed. That's why I haven't met with Dr. Sarkar at all, because I'm afraid he's just going to make me cry. <laughs> I'm just going to cry. Not. OK, Elizabeth, <laughs> I meet with him twice a week right now because I am in this class for the second time. He is not as scary as he he makes himself out to be he's not i promise you every every single prof professor seems really really scary until you meet them like one-on-one -on -one. yep or in, one like on small group he's settings a different dude dr sarkar is he's so chill he's so funny um you, you'll see this with a lot of your different professors in, in try th three try two try three Whenever you take microbiology, right now, um, try, try uh, to right microbiology, Dr. S is another one of those where if you're in a group setting, she seems terrifying, like she hates all of you, <laughs> but you get her more of in a small group one on one and you express that you need help and she will move heaven and earth to make sure you get what you need. Like she is. A, I'm getting a ready lot, to do that this week. A lot of the teachers, like I said, they're they're very very willing to help, as specifically if you're coming to them for help, and not to argue and say this test was stupid, this was dumb, is more just if you approach them with that humility of like, help me, please. Yep, Dr. Sarkar, especially. Here's the thing. Don't wait until second exam like I did last trimester. Do it right off from the get-go. I started meeting with him from day one of this class this term. Yeah, I, I'm just, like, terrified that he's going to ask me something, and then I'm just going to not know, and I'm going to be like, I don't know, and I'm just going to cry. And I don't cry in front of people. Oh, I cried <laughs> in front of him twice last term. You're good. <laughs> like... That's like, why I just turned the camera the class that, like, I think it clicks. Like, it'll click tonight. Like, I'm good. And then tomorrow I'll look at it and I'll go, what the crap? <laughs> like, you Hope are you're muted. Like I said, that's, that's part of um, putting things into long-term memory is you need to start to program your brain to, like, to put stuff into more long-term memory. And it's a process and it's a skill and it's it's literally it is biology of waking up those learning muscles and like getting your brain to learn how to develop neural connections faster. And it's it's literally just it's kind of try, try, try as many different things as you can um, to find how your brain best retains information, how it best works. I highly recommend a lot of stuff here in biochem. Draw it out that the um, G protein coupled reaction, if you draw it, this was probably like when I drew this way back when, this was probably like the 10th or 15th time that I'd drawn it before I finally got a version of it that I was like, okay, I understand it. This is what I like. And even like right now, I look at this now and I'm like, okay, there's a couple little things on here that I probably should have included more information on. And so then like I take that and I continue to apply it in the future when like I, I prep, uh, when I do my own notes, when I prep for classes and stuff. And I've learned through all throughout the whole, the whole process. Ironically, um, my, uh, the notes and stuff that I, that I offer up, I would say try one is probably my least organized and least thorough of all my trimesters. Compared to to I all like that. everything, I looked at your micro notes compared to like biochem one, and I'm like, you can tell he'd moved on and gotten a little more together. Yeah, and the fur the further you get into everything, like like I said, like I I learned, you learn with, oh, hey, here's that GI question. Here's why. Because GI is the 
there's an inhibitory portion and there's a stimulatory portion. That's why that question is the decreases the cyclic AMP. Hmm. AI versus GA. Nice. <laughs> it is in the book. If it's in here, it's in the book. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I the the deeper you get into the program, the the trick is keep your head down, keep heart working hard, get through Absolutely. class by class, and the further that you can get into it, um, the better off you're gonna be. You're gonna keep learning. You're gonna keep growing. You're gonna learn how to properly learn. It's just you know, it's like right now, like I said, putting in the time to learn and grow to be able to do that. So. You guys got this. You can do it. It's not as bad. It gets better. <laughs> or it's worse. not bad, honestly. It <laughs> does get better. And like I can tell the difference just from the one class that I have that is a try two class versus like try one solely. It's like you hit panic mode, and I can tell you guys this. I'm Drake. Did you have your moment of sheer panic of like, what the hell am I doing? Oh, I. Listen, I'm gonna stop the recording because I don't want to share this with everybody. <laughs> um.